Department of Sanitation. Here. Department of Transportation. Here. Department of Youth and Community Development. Fire Department. Human Resources Administration. The Mayor's Office. National Grid. Here. New York City Housing Authority. New York City Transit. Office of Management Budget. Office of Emergency Management. Police Department. Small Business Services. Here. U.S. Postal Service and Verizon. Okay. So the first presentation is the New York City Law Department Family Court Division. We have Charles Rott, the Borough Chief, Janine Carter, Deputy Bureau Chief, and Tierra McLaughlin, Diversion Coordinator. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, um, you can hear me okay? Yes. All right. So, um, as indicated, my name is Charles Rod. I'm the borough chief in Brooklyn Family Court. I have some of my other um, uh, staff here today. I have my deputy borough chief, one of the deputy borough chiefs, Janine Carter. I have our diversion coordinator who is behind the pillar there, Tiara McLaughlin. And then I have one of our staff attorneys, Margaret Wang. Uh, here. So thank you guys very much for having us here. We did a presentation uh, for this group approximately two years ago um, and it was, it was very well received. We received a lot of feedback. Uh, we received a lot of requests for us to come out to uh, different areas of Brooklyn and do a similar presentation for some of the community boards. So it was, it was very good. Uh, we wanted to come back because in the area of uh, the family court, our practice has changed dramatically over the last two years with the uh, implementation of the Raise the Age legislation. So I wanted to come out, we wanted to come out, talk to you a little bit about, uh, about what our office does, a little bit about the Raise the Age legislation, what it means, um, and go through a little bit of the life of a case, what happens when a young person now under the age of 18 is arrested, and that case makes its way to our office to investigate uh, to prepare and then to present that case to a judge. So we have offices in all five boroughs. Uh, we're located uh, in each borough. Our offices, though, act independently in those boroughs. We act collectively uh, as part of the New York City Law Department. So our colleagues in Queens or uh, in Manhattan, we communicate with them regularly. We uh, share information. We share youth. Um, so we're in constant contact uh, with, with those staff members as well. The way our office is um, broken down is we have a borough chief, we have a number of supervisors that fall underneath that borough chief, and then we have a, no a number of staff attorneys and then other support staff uh, that, that are on our staff. With the implementation of Raise the Age, we were able to put forth um, in our budget request a lot of requests for additional services, which would include uh, the position that Tiara is in for a diversion coordinator, which she's going to talk to you a little bit about what that means. Um, a lot of community coordinators, additional social workers. So a lot of staff has come on board with the issuance of the Raise the Age legislation. So I would estimate approximately our staff two years ago till today has uh, tripled based on the legislation. So what do we do? Um, we're primarily involved in juvenile delinquency cases. That means young people who are under the age of 18, once they're, if they're arrested, their case does not go to the district attorney's office, except for a small number of very serious crimes. Their cases come to my office, again, to investigate and to potentially either put forth in front of a judge, decline those cases, or to have those cases go through um, diversion services. Assistant Corporation Counsels, that's the staff in my office. Um, that's what we call them. If you hear the term ACC, that's what it's making reference to the prosecutors in family court as compared to ADAs or the assistant district attorneys in criminal court. So the way the office is broken down is we have a number of units. Um, we have a major case unit. We have a special victims unit. Uh, major case handles just what it sounds like, major cases. Uh, the staff that's uh, part of that unit are experienced. Um, they've been here for a number of years. 
Uh, they're involved in the most complex cases that we see. Firearms cases, multiple uh, act of robberies, serious assaults with serious injuries, homicides, uh, those are the cases that are handled through that unit. Special victims uh, it details some of the in, uh, uh, type of cases that they handle as well. A lot of times, uh, teen dating violence. We see a lot of teen dating violence cases that come through. They're handled by these prosecutors. They have special training. Uh, they've gone through forensic <coughs> interviewing training. Much, much better equipped than our normal staff to handle uh, the issues that come up with these types of cases. Within those units, there's also a supervisor um, uh, chain. They also have unit chiefs, and then they have supervisors that fall underneath uh, those unit chiefs that their staff would then report to. So raise the age. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard of raise the age. New York was one of the only states uh, that did not um, deem cases of young people over the age of 16, sorry, under, well, from 16 years on to be juvenile cases. They were prosecuted as adults in criminal court. That has changed. Um, those cases, with a very small exception, which we'll talk about briefly, um, those cases now come to family court. They're either going to originate in family court or they're going to go to the district attorney's office, be drawn up in the district attorney's office, and then removed down to family court for the cases to be handled there. So back in 2017, Governor Cuomo signed the Raise the Age legislation. That legislation went into effect, into effect October 1 of 2018. So we've been involved with Raise the Age legislation, not just from the, 18, from the, the October 1 of 2018, We've been involved with Raise the Age for a number of years. Um, once it passed, we prepared. Uh, we increased staff. We in increased training. Um, we were involved um, in the, the implementation of Raise the Age directly in Brooklyn in coordination with the district attorney's office. The realization of 16 and 17 year olds, the number of those uh, uh, individuals who get arrested is significantly higher than the number of young people age 15 down to age 7, which is the original jurisdiction of the family court. So we needed to be ready. We needed to get our staffing prepared and we, need to be ready. we needed to be ready for these cases. Um, we've had a year under our belt. We've been dealing with 16-year-olds. Um, I can say it's gone very, very well. Uh, we work uh, in coordination with the district attorney's office. If you um, have had an opportunity to read um, any press with regards to raise the age legislation, Brooklyn is uh, at the forefront of the legislation. Um, we are the busiest borough with regards to cases that come out of criminal court, but also the criminal court, uh, the judge and the youth part, the number of cases that are actually transferred to family court of 16 year olds has been upwards of 90%. Higher than anywhere in the city, higher than anywhere in the state. As of this past October, 17-year-olds were included now into the legislation. The second phase of the legislation has now gone into effect. Um, I can't really comment too much on the 17-year-olds just because we're only, you know, two weeks or so uh, in. Um, the, the expectation is that we will see more 17-year-olds involved cases than we will have seen for the past year for 16-year-old involved cases. So just briefly with regards to Raise the Age, um, where did it come from? There's a lot of science. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, studies. Um, there's a lot of um, discussion around brain science, which talks about these young people at the age uh, of 16, 17 year old, 17 years old, uh, their brains are not fully developed. Therefore, their decision making, their cognitive skills are not fully developed. This was a lot of the, the, the push behind the Raise the Age legislation that, that, uh, that was put through. Um, any questions on Raise the Age? I know that's just it's a very, very generalized overview of, of the process. We'll go through a little bit more of what types of cases we're getting, um, the age of the youth that are coming over to us um, under the legislation, but any questions based on that? Okay. So a lot of the training that we did for our staff revolved around, well, what happens when a young person gets arrested? What if they're 14? What if they're 16? What if they're 17? Um, how do we know where that case is going to go? How do we know which court that case is going to originate in? And is that case going to eventually go from criminal court down to, to us in family court? So 
really the thing that you have to understand is there's a lot of terminology that's out there with regards to um, uh, uh, the youth. It's really the starting point for us. Um, we look to the age, we look to the nature of the crime. What are they being arrested for? A juvenile delinquent, that definition has not changed. We have jurisdiction in family court over youth, juvenile delinquents from seven years old up until 15 years old. They're considered juvenile delinquents. Those cases with only a very, very small um, amount of very serious cases, those cases are going to originate in family court, always, misdemeanors or felonies. There's also another uh, category. You can actually go to the next slide. There's actually, um, well, let me, let, me talk, let me discuss a little bit more about juvenile delinquents. So if a young person gets arrested for a misdemeanor, uh, maybe an assault in the third degree, a simple assault, or if that young person under the age of 16 gets arrested for a felony, most felonies, that case is going to originate in family court. If a young person is arrested for what's called a juvenile offense or a juvenile offender, that person is between the age of 13 years old, 15 years old, and the type of crime that they're arrested for qualifies under statute as a juvenile offense. That case originates in the district attorney's office. It's drawn up by the district attorney. They make the determination whether or not that case is going to be removed to family court. We are generally not involved in that discussion or that conversation. That's up to the district attorney's office as to whether that case will be removed uh, to us. <clears throat> the third category um, is adolescent offender. This is a new term. This was uh, something that came from the Raise the Age legislation. What an adolescent offender is, is a person who now, as of October 1st of this year, is a young person 17, uh, 17 years old, 16 years old. They can be charged with a misdemeanor they're an adolescent offender. If they're charged with a felony, they're an adolescent offender. What the difference is, where that case starts, where does it originate? Um, if the young person is 16 or 17 and they're arrested for a misdemeanor, family court has original jurisdiction over that case. That case will come directly to family court. It is not heard in the district attorney's office. They have no involvement. They don't write that case up. It comes directly to us. If the young person again, 16 or 17 years old, is arrested for a felony, that case does not come directly to family court. That case goes to the district attorney's office. The district attorney's office will write that case up, will arraign that case in front of um, a, new, a newly created court, which is called the youth part, and then that judge will make a determination whether that 16 or 17 year old felony case will then be transferred to family court. When I had uh, spoken uh, at the beginning, um, I was talking about a percentage, a number of cases that are being transferred from the district attorney's office down to family court, upwards of 90%. That's these cases. So these, again, I'm not going to talk about the 17-year-olds because we're, we're kind of new um, in, in that area, but with the 16-year-olds, the district attorney's office is transferring in upwards of 90% of those cases to us in family court. So a lot of those felony 16-year-old arrests have come down to us. They're not staying within the criminal justice system in the adult, in the adult, um, adult courts. If a young person is arrested um, for a misdemeanor, they're seven years old, up till they're 17 years old, that case can come directly to court. There does not have to be a waiting period. There does not have to be a holding over period. If court is open, family court is open, that case will come directly to us. If family court is not open, that case can come to us the next day. It will appear with us the next day. Police department also has the ability to issue an appearance ticket to have that young person come in a few days. Um, we operate uh, evening court. We operate weekend court. Um, those courts are, uh, family court is done collectively in Manhattan at 100 Center Street for all the five boroughs. So what we've done over the last several years is we've, um, staffed weekend court, so we've been there as a family court to have a young person if they're arrested on a Friday night. They don't have to spend time um, uh, at Horizons Nation of whether the case is gonna remain in criminal court or the case is gonna be coming down to us in, in family court. An important thing here too in the, in the statute, 
There's a legal presumption which is built into the statute, which is a presumption against custody. So if a young person goes, a case is drawn up, goes in front of the youth court, there's a presumption that that person should be released. Um, doesn't always happen. There are cir circumstances where the judge, the district attorney asks for bail or asks for remand, and, and sometimes the judge does grant that. Um, there can be a remand granted in the case, a consent to transfer to family court. That will happen the same day. So if a young person gets arrested, goes in front of Judge Walker in the youth part, there's an application to have that person detained. The district attorney makes that application and also consents to transfer to family court. That happens. When the case comes to us, that young person goes in front of a judge that same day for a hearing. The next slide I'm not really going to go through. Um, this is the process. Um, this is the process by which a 16-year-old now, 17 as well, that a case will either remain in criminal court or will be removed down to, I keep saying removed, transferred down to um, family court. Anybody have any questions on that? It's a very involved part of the legislation. It's very technical. Um, we continue to find bits and pieces of the legislation that we have questions about. Um, yeah. Well, the DA doesn't doesn't run the the family court in the in the justice center. So we've always had staff um, that appear on. If young people are arrested in the 7-2, the 7-6, or the 7-8 precinct, those cases, for the most part, will be heard in front of Judge Calabrese in, in Red Hook. Um, Judge Calabrese was um, uh, petitioned for and wanted to become a youth part as well, and he was successful. So Judge Calabrese is a youth part. So if a young person, 16 or 17, is arrested in one of those Red Hook precincts, that case will be sent to Red Hook to be heard by him. Um, we have staff that, that does appear. Um, we don't appear regularly because there's not a lot of cases that happen with juveniles in those precincts or in Red Hook. Um, but we do appear there. We do staff Red Hook. So people who are assigned to family court are in Red Hook. Yeah. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. As a non-attorney, um, what is the reason why Judge Craig Walker has the, uh, is the only person making he, he is the, the youth part judge in criminal court. There are some other judges who, um, who do cover for him, um, but he's the primary youth part judge in criminal court. He's a Supreme Court judge. Um, I don't know if I can really answer the reason why he is Just the judge. I don't, know. I, I don't know how many cases are coming it just sounds like it's probably voluminous. <laughs> and I'm just thinking in terms of the quantity, why is it just one judge? Anyway. Yeah, I, I, I think OCA is probably better qualified to, to answer that question. Um, but the judge that we appear primarily is in front of is, is Judge Walker in the youth court. Any other questions? OK. So the big question then is really, what happens to a case when it comes to us? So. There's been jurisdiction established. We know that that case is now with us. How do we get that case and what, what do we do with it? So we don't get the first um, bite of the apple with regards to a juvenile case. That comes from the Department of Probation. So the Department of Probation and built into our statute is um, a process by which they will look at all cases. They will screen them. Does not matter if it's a uh, a misdemeanor or a felony. It does not matter if the young person is 17 years old or if they're seven years old. All family court cases will originate through the Department of Probation. Um, a probation officer will be assigned that case. They will talk to some of the parties involved, usually the police officer, the victim, the young person who's been arrested, and then they're going to make a determination. Does this case go to the prosecutor's office to investigate? or does this case go to what they call adjustment services? What adjustment services are basically, and I don't want to speak for the Department of Probation, but it's, um, it's, it's a process by which a young person has to do certain things over a period of time. If they're successful and they do what they're asked to do, at the end of that period of time, that case is not referred. 
That case is dismissed and that case is sealed. It never sees the prosecutor's office, never sees the judge. Um, the initial term of how long this adjustment process will be used to be 60 days. Um, the governor signed a new bill which will extend that initial period to 90 days. That's going to take effect in December of this year, December 12th. The Department of Probation does consult with the victim on the crime um, and takes into consideration what their position is with regards to uh, what should ultimately happen with that case. If probation either decides this is a case that's not appropriate for adjustment or decides that this case was an adjustment and failed adjustment, they're now going to refer the case to our office to go through, investigate, to see if we have something that we're going to move forward with, um, to see if it's something that we're going to decline, we're not going to move forward with, or to see if it's something that we have services that we connect with internally as well as with outside services, that we can connect this young person to those services with the understanding that if they're successful in those services or those programs, that we will not move forward on those cases. Just so once the case comes to us, if we're going to investigate the case, we're going to look for witnesses, we're going to look for evidence, video evidence, um, eyewitnesses, we're going to go through um, police department documents, body camera uh, is, a, is a very important thing these days to us, um, and we're going to make a determination whether we think there's sufficient evidence to move forward and actually file a case. If there's not, we're not going to move forward, we're going to decline the case. Prior to uh, making the determination as we're investigating the case, we're going to look to see if we can maybe use one of our internal programs or utilize our diversion coordinator to try to have uh, that young person linked up with services that we think are appropriate. So um, Tiara McLaughlin is here. She's our diversion coordinator. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about the work that she does. Um, I will just say that um, Tiara on our staff is a, a relative, uh, relatively new position. Um, She's been here since Raise the Age legislation came, uh, came about. Um, Tiara is somebody that is um, very friendly with each one of the prosecutors in our office. Um, she's somebody that I remind the prosecutors every day to go and talk to her if they think they have a potential case that does not have to go in front of a judge. If we have a situation with a young person who is in need of services, Tiara is going to identify those services. She's going to identify that program, and then she's going to link the young person to that program, again, with the understanding that if successful in that program, this case, the guarantee from our office is this case will not move forward. We will not have this case go in front of the judge. So I think that's where you guys all come, come, uh, come into this picture as well. If you have programming, you have services in your community, or you have things that you think would assist us where we can link up with these program directors, and uh, they're willing to accept referrals for our young people, we want to know who they are. We want to know about their program. We want them to come in and to talk to our staff because if we can link a young person with services within their community and we don't have to go forward and we don't need to go forward on this case because we know those issues are going to be addressed, that's exactly what we want to do. So Tiara's going to... Sure. <laughs> um, so, ooh, I'm loud. Sorry. Ooh, sorry. Um, CJ basically summed it up on what diversion is. Um, when a case is referred to our office, we have the option of diverting it. Um, when, what that means is as long as a youth completes an assignment or goes to a program for a specified amount of sessions or months, then we will seal the case and decline to prosecute it. Um, the idea behind diversion is that we provide meaningful, effective programs for the youth. So in one in one breath, they are able to take accountability for what has happened, but on the other breath is to give them the resources that they may need. So for instance, if there's a youth who maybe, you know, isn't doing anything productive after school. So if we refer them to a specific program, maybe um, I like to look to see if they can, after they finish their diversion, maybe they can stay on with the program to do something effective after school. Um, Diversion isn't appropriate for all cases. Um, some of the cases that it's inappropriate for are teen dating violence cases, um, family offense cases, and some cases with extreme violence. So some of the programs that we use for diversion, CJ spoke about it earlier, pre-filing adjustment, which is handled by the Department of Probation, um, mediation, which is handled by the Peace Institute, 
Youth Court, which is handled by the Center for Court Innovation. There are youth courts in all five boroughs. Brooklyn happens to have two. We have one that is housed at the Red Hook Community Justice Center, as well as one that is housed at the Brownsville Community Justice Center. Um, the Red Hook Youth Court takes on the traditional youth court setting of having a community advocate, a youth advocate, um, a judge, and a jury, which are all led by youth. In Brownsville, they have now transitioned to kind of like the Brownsville Keepers, where youth are um, take place in a restorative justice circle, where they are part of the sanction process. Um, after a case is heard in youth court, the youth court members issue sanctions. Those sanctions can be letter of apologies, days of community services, or it can also be like case management with the um, staff members on site. Another type of diversion program is a graffiti slash shoplifting packet. So what it is is a little thick packet where you've completed, after they completed, we kind of go over the answers um, and then that's basically it. The YES program, that's also a program that's dedicated um, primarily to shoplifting. Conflict coaching is a one-on-one um, -on -one session between a youth and a trained conflict coach where they discuss accountability, goal setting, decision making, and how to um, make better decisions moving forward. Lastly, there's community conferencing. So similar to kind of Brownsville Keepers and the restorative justice model, community conferencing, um, the goal is for a youth to restore the harm done to the community. So they, the idea is that a community member as well as the young person will sit inside of a restorative justice circle and they will come up with an agreement on how the youth can restore um, harm to the community. Um, and as CJ said, we're always looking for new diversion programs. These are the lists that we kind of use citywide. There are some that are specific to Brooklyn. We also use a program called Young New Yorkers. They are located at 345 Adams Street. They have one day sessions where youth can discuss um, accountability, goal setting, but they are more in a setting with other youth. They also have a eight week program dedicated to males only, as well as a four week program for girls only. Um, so if you have any questions or if you know of any programs that you think may be a great fit, I'll leave my card on the table. Any questions for me? No, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Janine Carter. I'm one of the deputy borough chiefs. And um, specifically, I'm one of the co-coordinators of the community outreach in Brooklyn. So basically, what community outreach is, is exactly how it sounds. We go out into the community as the law department, and all five boroughs actually participate in community outreach. And the goal is to do some outreach with the community, with the police department, with the schools, with local community groups, in order to reduce recidivism among the youth. Um, the goal is to uh, have better, a better understanding of the community concerns and also to enhance our cases. We want to develop these relationships with the community so that we can help these youth go down a different path. Uh, some of the examples of the community outreach efforts that we um, as the, at the law department conduct are we do school presentations, we go to community uh, meetings such as the build a block meetings, the precinct council meetings, we do tabling events, we go to teen day, we participated here in the um, courthouse recently in June, and we also do career day events, as well as um, any other kind of um, events that the community has that's appropriate. And we also, when we go to these events, we um, conduct what are called presentations. Uh, we have five presentations. Uh, the first presentation I'm going to discuss is the family court and juvenile delinquency presentation. Now this one is a presentation that pro provides an overview of the family court system, kind of what CJ discussed today, so that the youth and the community can learn what the system actually is for the juvenile delinquency system. It's done so that we can try to reduce the number of youth who enter the juvenile uh, justice system. The second type is to raise the age le legislation, and this also provides an overview of that legislation. It provides a rationale of why we have implemented it and what the recent changes are with the, uh, within the practice. The next presentation is the Why Does It Matter? Is my social media behavior typical or toxic? 
Now this uh, presentation addresses cyberbullying and other negative online uh, interactions. The participants, they learn how to be safe online, what are violations of the law, and uh, be responsible for their behavior. This is an interactive presentation, so the, the youth are able to participate and see how what they do online can affect their lives and affect others. The next presentation is a bullying education workshop, workshop for students and parents. And this one is done so it can empower the youth to be able to stand up in their communities, in the school, to learn about the effects and the causes of bullying. And they're also afforded an opportunity to speak with a family court prosecutor about the effects of bullying and how, how they perceive it and how they can address it. And finally, the last presentation um, that is done is, this, is your social life. Is it typical teen behavior or is it toxic and bullying? Now this presentation discusses the various forms of the social media and helps teens and parents to discern the, the behavior and what is problematic so that it can be diverted and that it can, um, and so that they can be able to identify whether they have either engaged in this bullying behavior or if they know someone who has. Now anyone can, if you wanted a presentation at your school or at your community board meeting or, or at some other venue with churches or different venues, you can, res, you can ask for a presentation online and uh, the link is posted there at www.nyc.gov slash community presentations. You go online, there's a, a bit of a, like a questionnaire you fill out and then someone will contact you about being able to get a presentation done. We do the presentations, we have a concentration in certain precincts, but we do presentations in all the precincts in the borough. So it's available, you just need to reach out and we will be able to do that. And if you have any questions or concerns, you can always contact any of us. Thank you. Um, at, at our numbers here, um, CJ's number is there, my number is Antier's number is present on the screen. Um, if you have any uh, events that are coming up that you would at, like the, the law department to attend, to table, we're also available for that as well. You can always reach out to me at my uh, email address at jacarter at law.nyc.gov or at my phone number 718-724-5328. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. So I, I do just want to stress really quickly with regards to community outreach. I think that's one of the things that um, our office has really um, put a lot of energy and effort into in making sure that the prosecutors that are uh, within the office are assigned to go out to different events within the community um, all throughout Brooklyn. Uh, we have good relationships with the precinct commanders in Brooklyn. We talk to the NCO officers. We talk to the uh, community members at the community council meetings really to address those issues that the young people are presenting within the communities in which they live, um, how their actions are affecting the community in which um, uh, they're committing acts. So again, really try to stress, um, do not hesitate to reach out to us. If you have issues or you have concerns with regards to the youth in your precinct, uh, within your district, please, please let us know. Please reach out. At minimum, we can contact with the police department who's in that area. Um, if you have different events, Teen Day, um, um, uh, Family Days, if you have different things where we can come out and we can talk to the young people. School presentations as well are a big thing uh, that we like to get out to as well to talk to uh, the middle school age children and, and let them know some of the realities of the interactions that they're engaged with and really what can happen to them, unbeknownst to them, of uh, the actions that they're involved in. Um, it, it's pretty eye-opening to hear young children ask certain questions and the reactions to when we say that, you know, if you're next to this other person and that person is doing this, you can get arrested for that. It, it, it blows them away. Um, but those are good things, I think, for us to get out and talk to these young people to make them understand um, that 
you know, they have to be careful with the actions they're being involved in because they can get caught up in something that they have nothing to do with. Um, <clears throat> so again, I really can't stress that, that uh, enough, that if you have organizations or you have community members or you have groups that really want to have a conversation uh, with somebody from our office, please reach out and, and let us know. I have some business cards. I'll leave them on the table as well on the way out. Um, feel free to shoot me an email and we will, uh, we will do what we can. We don't always do our community outreach in, in conjunction with the police department. We like to also sort of diversify our portfolio a little bit and do things um, with the community that, that are not NYPD related or not um, uh, uh, sponsored by the police department. So. Um, I don't believe the materials are in multiple languages, but we have staff who do speak multiple languages. Um, it's a great question. Right. Right. I think that if you identify a program or something that you want us to come out and to, to present, if you let us know the language, I think at minimum we have access to interpreter services. We can bring an interpreter with us and that person can, can interpret. Um, if, we, if we know in advance, we can at least make the effort to try to have the materials translated into uh, whatever language the presentation is going to be in, but that, that's, a, that's a great point. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to go quickly. I know that we, we've taken a lot more of your time than, than we should. Um, so once a case is filed in court, we, we talk to the witnesses, we talk to the people involved, we present, we prepare a petition and we present charges in front of the judge. The young person obviously is represented by counsel. Um, there's, the life of the case at that point can really go in a lot of different ways. If the case is going to go forward uh, with the judge, there could be suppression hearings which means that if a young person made some sort of statement where they were arrested with some kind of property on them, or there was some kind of identification procedure that was done um, that led to that person's arrest, there'll be hearings with regards to that to see if that is legal, if, if the, the rights of this young person were violated in maybe the recovery of some property off of them during the arrest. So that will happen. We'll then also move forward um, after those hearings to what we call a fact-finding hearing, which is a trial, same thing. Um, where we present witnesses, present evidence, and we have to prove the case to a judge beyond a reasonable doubt. Family court, there's no juries. We do not uh, present cases in front of a jury. There are bench trials that are done in front of uh, judges. At, <clears throat> excuse me. At the conclusion of the case, the judge is now going to make is going to have to make a determination as to what is the disposition, what's the appropriate sentence in this case. Um, the judge has a lot of information at his or her disposal. So a lot of reports that are generated. We look into certain areas and we present evidence to the judge as well. And we make an argument to the judge what we feel is the most appropriate um, disposition at the conclusion of a case. There's a lot of different options. The judge can adjourn the case for six months. If the young person doesn't get in any trouble within that period of time, the case is dismissed and sealed. The judge can issue what's called a conditional discharge, which means that the young person for up to 12 months has to do certain things that the court asks, and again, not get arrested. Judge can place a young person on probation for up to two years. That le the level of probation can go from what we call level one, which is the lowest level of supervision, all the way up through uh, something called level three. There's also community-based organizations that get involved as a condition of probation. Some of them are listed here. Some are run by the Department of Probation. Some are not run by the Department of Probation. There's also um, placement. There's different levels of placement of a young person removed from their community and placed in a facility. The judge also has the ability to um, have a young person go to an OMH facility if they present with some mental health issues, serious mental health issues that require their removal from the community. Um, historically, over the last few years, the number of youth that are removed from community has dropped dramatically. The number of cases that we're making recommendations to have a young person removed from the community has dropped dramatically. So I think that's all that, that, that we have. Um, I really do want to thank everybody again. I know I've said it about four times, but really encourage you that if you have somebody uh, in your community or you have a group or an organization who would like to have us come out and do a presentation, 
Um, if you can have some, uh, some young people in the community also at that presentation, that's what we like to really do is talk to those young people. Um, please let us know, please reach out. Um, but thank you very much, we really uh, appreciate your time. Um, on behalf of Janine and, and Margaret and Tiara, um, thank you guys very much. So thank you again to the New York City Law Department for your thorough presentation today. The next presenter we have is Con Edison, um, David DeSanti, and he is the Vice President of the Brooklyn Queens Electric Operations at Con Ed, and he will be speaking on the Brooklyn Electric Operations Snapchat. Did I hit the wrong button? I think I hit the right bu wrong button off the bat. bat. The um, clicker is oh. right here. Sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so we put together an agenda um, try to brief you on, on current topics. I'm also going to cover. Um, sorry, I'm also going to cover uh, the outages in in July in uh, Brooklyn and, and take any questions you have. Um, and again, I'll try to go through this quickly. How many folks were here when uh, our president came at uh, Eric's invitation to speak about the outages? Good. Then I think you'll find it uh, it, it interesting. Um, and again, I'll tr try to go quickly through it so I can take any questions you might have that are uh, beyond these topics. So the, the agenda very quickly, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the Brooklyn system overview and configuration, uh, a little bit about system performance in, in uh, recent years, uh, talk briefly about the uh, heat event, uh, the events during the heat wave, the investments we make, some reliability plans going forward in the Brooklyn area, specifically related to the heat wave incident, um, talk about some uh, auto loop improvements uh, on the southern border, and we're going to talk about the uh, smart meter deployment status. So very quickly, so you have an understanding of, of the configuration of our system. Um, over on the left uh, is the generating capacity. We don't actually own any generation anymore. We've divested probably about 12 years ago. We only maintain the uh, 14th Street uh, station uh, to make steam essentially for our system. That's, so it's a very small bit of the generation mix. All the generation is independent. It, it goes through the uh, independent system operator up, up in Albany and so forth. And, and a great deal of the power we consume comes from, from the uh, St. Lawrence uh, uh, River Basin. A lot, lot of, a uh, um, bit large component of it is, is water power and uh, nuclear and, and prime movers. It then goes through uh, what's known as our transmission system, which is like kind of like the, the super highway underneath New York City, mostly made up of 345, 138,000 volt cables built in loops. Um, and they supply area substations. Those area substations now break that, that voltage down into more usable components, bring it down to what's known as feeder level cables. In Brooklyn, Queens, those cables run at about 27,000 volts. The predominant uh, distribution uh, format in, in Brooklyn, Queens, and most of the city area is underground, and with an underground configuration, those feeder cables come out from the substation. They pick up a number of uh, distribution transformers along the way. Those transformers uh, drop that power down to what we use in our house, 120. 208 volts, and they're connected by a grid of interconnected secondary cables in which the, the load is tapped off of. Um, the, the other configuration we have is a non-network uh, overhead system, and that's predominantly in areas that were developed that are predominantly three-story residential areas where, you, where the loads tend to be, to be lighter, and it's a, um, it's, a, uh, it's a very different style of system. It's a radial type system. So if we look at the system overview, um, about 92% uh, of the load, in terms of load, about 90%, 2% of the load is fed off the underground system, 8% is on the overhead. In terms of customer breakdown, it's about 90-10%. Um, and we have 11 second contingency networks in, in the Brooklyn area. Second contingency is our design criteria within the five boroughs, um, I'm sorry, excluding Staten Island. And, it, and essentially what it, what it allows for is at peak design, we can lose any two system components um, either on the, on the network or even in a, in a building configuration, right? So if you're putting up a big building in Brooklyn, 
you're automatically going to get three transformers in that large building, right? So because we've got to be able to, to handle a loss of any, any two. And that's what second contingency um, means, and there's there a lot of resiliency in this system. Most utilities only design the first contingency. Um, the um, non-network electricity is supplied by um, a, a group of 15 4 kV unit substations in an overhead grid format. Um, we're probably the only utility that uses an, an overhead grid format in the 4 kV. Uh, and, and that's the system I'll talk about later that we, uh, we unfortunately had to shut down uh, for a period of time. We also have 18 auto loops, and these auto loops are when we take feeders directly out of the substation at 27 kV and basically su supply customers right directly from the uh, series of overhead uh, breakers. To give you an idea of the system performance, um, on the network system, um, we, we, we basically look, and this is kind of a universal uh, tracking, we look at the frequency. Safety is a, is a reporting um, um, system that, that the Public Service Commission uses to kind of compare apples and oranges, different utilities. Safety is the frequency customers can expect to be interrupted. On the underground network system in 2018 in, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, about 27 out of 1,000 customers experienced an interruption. Uh, year to date in 2019, it's about 23. On the non-network system, um, to give you a feel for that, uh, it's about, Brooklyn is about 384. Um, across all of the Con Edison overhead system, it's about 389 per thousand. So we're pretty much on the average in Brooklyn. Uh, if you take that up to the state level, uh, at New York State, it's about 1,030 per thousand are out. So, so pretty much around the state, you're, you're gonna be out of power at least once a year. The 2019 number is uh, elevated, that 741 reflects the outages in July. So that, that's really where you get the, the big impact in, in that number. So we're going to talk briefly about the, the heat wave and what we ran into. So uh, on, this, on this diagram, on the right-hand side, you have the, the sensible um, New York City heat index numbers. We we're up over 100 in terms of heat index. For Con Edison, we have a design criteria where we use what's known as temperature variable. And you know, it's not just temperature that hits you, but it's, it's humidity. So we look at basically um, the, we take the combined of the uh, average of the, of the uh, the uh, dry and wet bulb temperature, and we also express it across a continuum of three days, because there's a lot of thermal inertia in our system, and we have to account for that. Um, once we're above 86 TV, and that this day, the, the Sunday of the three-day heat wave, actually four-day heat wave, actually came in at uh, 86.9, so we were we were above our, our design. Um, it's kind of a rare event. Um, happens uh, maybe in the past. It's happened a few times in a decade that we go above design. Um, and what that requires us is, if you look at these gradations, the blue, the yellow, and the red, those are uh, uh, st standardized mobilization uh, curves we have for what kind of resources we bring, bring to bear. And at um, above 86, we go into what's known as a full scale, where we mobilize our, our corporations, so to speak, to respond to, to outages. Um, so on Friday, the, we went into a court, we opened our corporate emergency response center in 14th Street. We basically clear out an auditorium. We bring in desks. We bring in all of our logistics support, all of our, or our engineering support. We also bring in a lot of agencies, uh, OEM being probably the, the chief uh, among them. Uh, we also had about 4,000 employees that we put on 12-hour shifts, 24/7. Um, and that, that mobilization um, lasted for almost a full week. Um, we also procured some mutual assistance. We, we got some crews in uh, to help us uh, hold parking spaces as we were trying to switch things on the system. And we brought in about 60 overhead crews because all heat waves tend to end in a thunderstorm and uh, we always like to have some extra help around. We also pre-positioned emergency generators. These are large units. These are two megawatt uh, synchronous generators that can join to our 4 kV system. And we pre-positioned them in Staten Island Brooklyn, also up in uh, Westchester County. Um, just to give you an idea of what load reduction we have, um, one, of the, one of the difficult things about network distribution is uh, the customers are there. They're, they're there all the time. Uh, they, they, don't, they, don't, uh, 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 we don't, they don't get dropped pretty much when I lose a feeder. What happens when I lose a feeder in a network system, and, um, 
and the network I'm going to talk to you about has 19 feeders, Flatbush Network, uh, in the southeast Bronx, southeast uh, Brooklyn. And w so when a feeder, feeder is lost, uh, that capacity just transfers to the other feeders. It redistributes. Uh, so the load on those remaining feeders goes up, and the likelihood of them failing goes higher. And as you drive further and further into contingencies, it, it gets more and more difficult to maintain. So the load relief uh, uh, measure, reduction measures we have would be general customer appeals, focused network appeals if we're starting to have problems in a network. And we, when we lose two feeders, we begin to go out and ask uh, folks in that community, we give boundaries, can you begin to, to, to only use what's essential? Um, um, the, the next step is the uh, distribution load relief program. We have programs funded uh, through NYSERDA that allow us to offer large customers um, a contract where at our demand they will turn their power off and so forth and, and they receive compensation uh, for that. Um, we also have uh, voltage reduction which is available to us at the substation at the both the 5 and 8 percent level. Uh, 5 percent uh, really is not impactful or very noticeable to customers. What it does is it reduces the current a little bit on our feeders but it also reduces the voltage stress which uh, in, in recent science is is uh, really helps quite a bit with reliability. 8% uh, voltage reduction is as far as we go with that. That will be sensible to customers, and if there's any uh, defects, any latent defects that are out there in the electrical system, customers will start to see that. They'll start to see their air conditioning uh, log, and they could get into low voltage situations that would be impactful. Um, and the last would be load shedding, which is selective de-energizing of components. Uh, on occasion, that might be uh, big buildings that we select, and in this case, it was a, uh, a portion of the network uh, that we, uh, we de-energized. So to give you an idea of the configuration of the Flatbush network in the southeast, Bron uh, southeast uh, Brooklyn, uh, it's really a hybrid network, um, and it's, it basically supplies, um, in this area up here, this area in this corner, is all a dense uh, underground network area. And, and in that area is a population of about uh, 132,000 customers or 398,000 uh, uh, residents. Um, in, the, in the southeast portion, it's fed predominantly from a 4 kV overhead network grid, which I'll show you in a moment, and uh, one, one auto loop. And that's 33,000 customers or, or about 89,000 uh, residents. Um, what, 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 what occurred was um, that Sunday, was actually um, the highest peak we ever recorded on, on the system on a weekend. Um, load moves around during a given day, right? When we talk about our system peak, that's typically a, a Monday to Friday day when Manhattan has got office, all, all its office buildings uh, working. And the peak kind of moves around. The peak in Manhattan is about 3.30 in the afternoon. The peak in Brooklyn, Queens is about 7.30 when, when everyone comes home. On the weekend, the, uh, the peak is quite, quite lengthy. It starts at about 3 in the afternoon and goes to about 10 at night. Um, and what would happen here was we were above design. This wasn't actually the peak that the Flatbush Network had seen. We actually saw uh, higher loads in 2011, and that speaks volumes about uh, all we've been able to accomplish together with the community with uh, energy efficiency. Um, and it's really helped quite a bit. Um, so what we began to do was as, as feeders began to fail in the network, and we got to the third contingency. Now again, second contingency design, we can lose any two feeders and still maintain uh, full capacity at design. When we got to the third, we went to, we implemented 8% voltage reduction. We had done 5% at the second. And we went out custom, with customer appeals and uh, asked people to, to only use essential load. Um, as we began to lose feeders, um, and things began to get overloaded. When we eventually got to six of the 19 feeders out, uh, we decided, and in fact, in the, in the, this is the 4 kV grid. In the 4 kV grid, we also had a, um, one of the substations uh, that feeds into the grid was out on trouble. We had some, we had a, a breaker fail. We were in the process of trying to restore that. We actually had seven of the 15 banks out. It was not sustainable. Uh, wire would have begun, would begun to uh, fail, underground cables failed. We, we did, in fact, get some limited damage uh, uh, during this, uh, and we had, to, uh, we had to shut it down. The, um, 
the decision was driven strictly by, by system conditions. Uh, not to do so would have likely led to a cascading failure that would have taken the major network down, those additional 398,000 customers. Um, and if you can recall uh, Long Island City uh, 13 years ago, that was, that was essentially what happened. You had a cascading failure, they lost 10 feeders, the network was not shut down, and customers were out of power for uh, eight days, as, as long as eight days, and it was uh, really a critical event. We, we never like to, to uh, preemptively put customers out of uh, power, but in this situation, we had to. To give you an idea of how concentrated the failures were, we have 65 independent networks in the system fed by about 1,600 underground feeders. During the three days, we lost 46 of those feeders, 16 in the peak period, six in this particular network. It was very concentrated. The failures were quite random, uh, a mixture of cable and joint failures, uh, but the clustering in this one network m made it untenable. We, we did have to shed load to get past it. Shoot. Yes, yes. It only impacted that, that 4 kV uh, network grid. Um, so if we look at the restoration, um, by, by 2,300 hours, we had about 11,000 of those customers uh, back in service. By midnight, uh, about 15,000, about half the customers were back by midnight, along with the, the other 3.2 million customers that did not lose power uh, around the system. Um, and then what, what, what happened is, on the mid, as you see on the midnight, things began to slow down. And what happened on the midnight shift was our capacity kind of, we, we kind of ran up to the capacity in our feeders in restoration, and we had to wait for feeder cables to be repaired before we could begin to continue restoring customers. We did that through, throughout the day, and then uh, as, the, as, the, as the, the heat broke, we got hit with a, um, a thunderstorm that, that Cross Brooklyn Queens interrupted probably another 16 or 17,000 customers, so we had to deal with that. Some, if you remember that storm, it was loaded with lightning. Some did come back and impact customers with lightning in the very same group uh, that had been impacted. Um, essentially, the last customers from this event, both events, were restored at 0300 on the uh, 23rd. So, um, you know, two, two things that, are going to be, that people would look at in terms of, uh, of being ready for, for an event like this is, is one thing you'd look at is the, the investments, the capital investments we made in the systems, and the other is the operational response. I've talked a lot about the operational response, but I want to talk about the, um, you know, how we prepare. So, so basically, we, have a, we take a pretty long-term view of, 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 you know, load relief and how things are happening. Um, one, of the, one of the real good stories here is, um, you know, if you, if you go back to the beginning of the electrical system and you track gross domestic product and, and load, they kind of track together, right along with each other. Um, and long about eight years ago, they began to depart. And that's really energy efficiency taking place, right? That's, that's a real, real big gain for folks. But at the end of every year, we look at the load, we look how things are moving around, we, we, uh, and we plan for next summer. Um, our capital planning uses a tool we've had in place probably for about a dozen years uh, that helps us prioritize those investments. Um, we, we put more than four, 15 billion into the system in the last 14 years, and in Southeast Brooklyn, um, in the Flatbush network, we put about 208 million. Um, the networks in Brooklyn, we report uh, every year to the Public Service Commission on the 10 networks we, we, we put the most dollars in. And eight of the ten uh, uh, are eight of the ten this last year, and pretty much every year for the last ten moves around a little bit. Pretty much uh, that goes into Brooklyn Queens networks. Uh, in terms of pure reliability dollars, this is these are dollars that are spent not for new buildings going up or for load relief, but just to just to uh, uh, retire components that are less reliable. Uh, we spend about 25% more in Brooklyn than we do in, in Manhattan. Um, and we do that really through our engineering uh, models. Um, just to talk about the investments we're going to make to make sure this does not occur again in, the, in this area, uh, we've, we've basically uh, boiled it down to uh, it, just in the fall, we're going to go out and we're going to replace uh, seven sections of underground cable, about eight spans of aerial cable on this one, one feeder uh, that failed during the, during the period. Also, out on the Cropsey Loop, 
we're going to be installing a sensing transformer and making automatic a tie to another network down at Brighton. So we'll be able to, uh, to uh, make that, that loop more reliable. Uh, and we began patrolling, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about what we're going to be doing with the three loops on the, on the fringe. So again, this will continue into 2020, where we really start to get going, changing a lot more uh, cable. Again, this is older uh, cable that uh, we stopped installing this cable um, probably in the, in the mid to late 1980s. Uh, but it's less reliable cable, and we're going to, we're going to increase the, uh, the, the investment there. Um, and then we're going to begin installing um, um, some interrupter switches. No utility's ever done this before. What we do is on a feeder cable, right? When you when you have a fault on a feeder, you if you if the cable fails, the breaker opens, and you lose the entire feeder on on the uh, on the run. Uh, these interrupter switches now will be put at a midpoint. So if anything happens beyond that point, it'll 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 take that portion of the feeder out and retain the balance of the feeder makes the network itself that much more uh, reliable. Again, for the next uh, three years, we're going to con continue uh, to invest in cable retirement and uh, equipment retirement, probably 260 sections of uh, underground cable and aerial spans. We're going to in continue installing those interrupter switches on the remaining uh, six more feeders. And we're actually going to do something that's really quite quite routine for us every few years. As load moves around, we've got to do some load balancing and move some, some feeder uh, load around to make them more, more reliable. With regard to the auto loop, um, um, the auto loops, uh, we've taken a look at the performance of our auto loops on the southern fringe of Brooklyn, and they're not performing uh, really to our average. They're above our average, and we need to, we need to spend some, some, uh, some effort and dollars there. We've had our crews out since, uh, inspection crews out since September, October, and they physically have walked uh, each of these three loops, and we have, we've developed a, a list of work to be done. We've identified some repairs and improvements. Uh, these, those have already uh, begun, and, um, and they should be done by the end of the year, and, and, and we're hoping performance does improve. In the spring, we're also gonna revise our infrared inspection uh, program a little bit. Uh, what we do typically every year before, like probably around March, uh, April, in that time zone, we go out and we thermograph all of our main feeder runs to see if there's any, any defects, anything is starting to heat up. Typically, you're gonna find things like, like lightning strikes, uh, things of that nature that have sat there for a few years. They make pinholes, it's impossible to see with the naked eye. But as water packs in there and the cable degrades, you can see them with a thermograph. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of risk. We're gonna one-side these loops to impress some more load on them, and we're gonna thermograph them a little bit later, a little closer to like May, to see if we can develop more of these faults ahead of time and uh, make, make the system more reliable, we think, and resilient in the summertime. Uh, the last thing I wanted to brief you on was the smart meter deployment. Um, and this is gonna help us in a, a lot of different ways, right? Um, we're, we're one of the last utilities, major utilities, to, to make this investment. Uh, we thought it was prudent to do so, let, let other folks learn about it and, uh, and, and, and gain from their, their experience with it. Uh, we started this in 2018, and uh, we've been able to accelerate it, and we will be able to finish it by the end of Brooklyn, by the end of um, 2020. We've got about, uh, I think, the, the penetration rate's like uh, up over 50%. And in the, um, the uh, thunderstorm that rolled through on the 22nd, that, on that overnight, we were able to go out and ping all the meters, because we have two-way communication. We were able to ping all of the customers that said they were out of lights and we were able to eliminate and verify that 150 of them were actually in service, right? Because people call in outages, they get a menu, and you know, maybe they had a flicker, but they say it's an outage. And what that really does is this system will, will allow us to, to, to magnify our workforce because they're only going to real jobs. It's also going to give us a lot more information, a lot more quickly, a lot more accurately about load moving around. It's also going to offer customers the opportunity. We're also going to be experimenting this year with um, uh, seven different uh, pilot uh, rate tariffs, right? Where um, uh, a select number of customers who have had meters installed for up to a year are gonna be able to participate in a, in a program. Uh, we've got baseline data on them, they've had smart meters for a year, and now we can inject these new rates where they have opportunities to, uh, to um, 
be introduced to time of day use. So if you lose your, use your washing machine at night, you're going to pay a lot less for that than you do during the day and so forth. And we think that would incent behaviors in the right direction toward conservation. And that means that's less work we have to do building the system, reinforcing the system, and that, that lowers rates, right? And it also save them some, uh, some uh, money. Going toward the, um, uh, the end of the year, um, we're going to be releasing our much anticipated climate uh, study and working with uh, introducing that and uh, discussing that with the city uh, and really talking about, you know, what, what we see and uh, our, our peers and, and folks in, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the scientific community think about the impacts of global warming and what different, different strategies are, are before us. So, that concludes my plan remarks. Any questions you may have? Shoot. Um, a couple of questions. When did you first go up to, uh, to inspect the uh, Pacific Coast Speed Opening Permit? Did it go right now to take a look at the infrastructure? So, uh, we, so not a street opening permit. We have a, uh, there are certain embargo areas where we have to call and get a, uh, a permit to open our own structures, yes. There are certain areas, but it's it's not every place. It's okay. it's defined areas. Depends. Depends on what crew is there, uh, what the nature of that repair is. If it's a section of cable that has to be changed, they they might defer that to a later date. That that sort of thing. So, so to be of aid to the system, it has to be a synchronous generator, and those are very expensive deals, and they're typically only in very large uh, uh, installations. I think um, Kings Plaza was one. Kings Plaza, right, is one um, is one area. They have like six. They can contribute six megawatts uh, to the network. Um, but but we do encourage you know critical facilities to have generation. Right, I, I know that the uh, state law now requires gas stations to have backup generation. Uh, we, we encourage that, but they, they can't necessarily help the grid unless they're large installations with synchronous gear. Sure. Go ahead. So, uh, I represent the seven, but I didn't know they said, so I don't know who it is. I apologize. <laughs> So we, we, we really would love to put it someplace else, and I'd like to talk to you afterwards. If you can give me those areas, I'll have my engineering, Jen, Jen is right here. She can take that down and go back and take a look at it. But again, we do have to look at the feeder configuration, right? Um, we, we can't have it at the tail end of a, of a feeder. It's got to be pretty close uh, in to where, where the riser is for that feeder. So we've got to analyze it electrically. But we absolutely know you don't want these things uh, near a residential area, we try to minimize their use uh, w whenever we can, and uh, it, it's really not our, we, we hope not to use them, but it is um, one, one tool we can resort to when we start to lose, lose equipment. But if you can, uh, uh, we'll, we'll stay till the end, and if we can get those locations from you, we'll get back to you. Uh, we'll be glad to, glad to move them to a less populated if we can electrically. Okay, question back there. So um, there's a couple things. Um, so yes, we do outreach. Actually, when we, when we choose 8% voltage reduction, uh, our, our operators at the panel, when they, when they hit the button, 
what it does is it commands the substation to, to, to lower its, its uh, contact in the voltmeter. It also releases a communication package uh, and, and uh, triggers, triggers um, uh, press releases. Uh, in addition to community outreach, I believe we had two vans, and, and again, there's only so much you're going to be able to do with a, with a van um, and customer service folks. They can hand out claims forms and, and probably try to keep people locally informed. We also had dry ice out, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So, so in this case, we we did not have a great deal of time. There was a, actually about 11 minutes from when we lost the six feeder to when we, we, we made the decision. Uh, OEM has been talking to us. Uh, we're in, we're in, we're in uh, discussions with them. They want more granular information. They want to be able to communicate. Um, with, with constituents and areas, and I think we're going to end up with much crisp, crisper communication around this. These are not events that take place often. They're measured in decades. The last one we, we ran into was, uh, it was 13 years ago, and the last one behind that was 1999. So it's, they're not often, we, we don't have as robust a process as we do for voltage reduction, but we got to get better at it, and, and the city wants that, and uh, we will. We think we'll give her crisper, crisper communication around the next worst, telling them, hey, we're there. In this case, OEM is in the room with us. They, they, we began discussions with them around the fourth um, open auto, and the, uh, I, my understanding is the fire department was aware. Uh, around the fifth, they started moving people. They, they knew things were beginning to get, get, uh, get close. Uh, but, community, but, but outreach to the community, communication with customers, no, that, that's something we really have to ma make a decision on with government, um, and they have to take the lead on that. Any other questions? Okay, thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Next we will have National Grid, Keith Rooney. He is the Director of Relations and Community and Customer Community Management downstate. I'm actually not Keith Rooney. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, all. My name is Melanie Littlejohn, and I am the Vice President for uh, Customer and Community Engagement for the State of New York uh, for National Grid. So Keith let me um, steal a part of uh, his agenda today since I was here. And I think um, with respect to um, our colleagues who just presented from Con Ed, it, it, it's the second part of the discussion. And I think the theme will continue. Um, a big part of what we've been asked to focus on today is not only what um, we're doing with respect to the uh, Nessie uh, gas pipeline project and providing an update, but we've also been asked by many folks um, in or around Brooklyn for an update on what we're doing in the clean energy space as well. So when we think about reliability and resiliency and planning for the future, I think the theme will be very, very consistent. So um, with that, I promised Keith that I would not um, do his entire presentation, but uh, I will certainly be here as well to help facilitate any questions. So with that, let me turn it to Keith Rooney. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have to get my performance appraisal later this afternoon, so that's why uh, <laughs> you know, let me kick this off. <laughs> but uh, really, uh, I'm only going to take up about eight minutes of your time. I, only, I have about eight slides, so I'd ask you to please hold your questions to the end. I will stay here after the meeting and answer any specific questions that you have to your community boards. And um, 
appreciate what you do for your communities. Uh, I have experience serving on a in my own community, so I know how hard it is, and uh, it contributed to a lot of my gray hair. But with that, uh, I'm just going to hit a few slides. That this is forward here. We, uh... Just a high-level snapshot of who we are. Um, we have 2,000 employees downstate, and we serve Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island. We have 1.8 million customers. 1.2 of those customers are, are in the city. And uh, my role is to uh, manage the downstate, downstate team, which is New York City and Long Island. <clears throat> the energy uh, landscape continues to evolve. Uh, if you notice, you know, the Brooklyn Union Gas Company, which a lot of us worked for, um, myself included, we were a, a, a natural gas company that, that just worked on pipes in the ground. We are now in a transition from that gas, traditional gas company that's been here in Brooklyn for over 100 years into a clean energy space. Um, if you heard some of the stuff from the governor and some of the stuff from the mayor, we actually agree with both of them. We, we think it's time to transition into a clean energy company, and the, and the transition is real. I think I used uh, Blockbuster as an example. If you don't change your business, uh, you know, you'll be out of business. So clean is focus and, and, and decarbonizing the network. These are our major initiatives. I wanted to just talk to you really quick what we're doing in the clean energy space because we're not just a company that's saying, oh, we want a pipeline. Um, we invested in a company called Sunrun. Last year, on an average, we, can, we convert about 8,000 services a year to natural gas. This is the first time in our history that we actually converted more solar than we did gas. We, ha we have a $100 million investment in this company called Sunrun. We also acquired a company called Geronimo, which is out in Minneapolis, which is the biggest producer of solar and wind in the United States. Uh, really exciting time to be in the energy business, and we are making the moves to become this clean energy company. Electric vehicles, we have 165 charging stations. We actually offer our employees a $5,000 check if they buy an electric vehicle. Since we've done this, 380 people have taken, over the last six months, just in this region, have bought electric cars. And we're adding charging stations at all of our facilities. And, and uh, so the transition is real. Renewable gas and wind, we're, we have the deep water wind program going on. And we're also uh, working on another wind project to bring in solar into one of our power plants on Long Island that used to be uh, run by uh, electric and gas and oil. We're actually in the future going to convert this to a fully operational on solar, so that's exciting. And then for the Newtown Creek, anybody who's gone over the Kosciuszko Bridge, you see those big eggs when you come when you come over the bridge. If you see on your right hand side those eggs, this is a this takes human waste and recycles it into natural gas. This is a major project and a major initiative that we had with the New York City DEP, where we're going to take this is going to go live in January of this year. This is a major project that will power 25 homes off of completely renewable gas. So no natural, this is, this is the human waste and garbage that is converted into clean natural gas and then will power 2,500 homes. And that's really exciting to be involved in that. Wanted to give you an update on Nessie because I know that's what's on everybody's mind. And then I'm going to get into, I'm going to give you a high level of a view of what, how the system runs and then get into the customer impact. So in my old role before I worked in this team, I was the chief uh, system operator for New York State, upstate and downstate. So I spent uh, almost 30 years operating the system. So I'm going to give you a really quick class and make it really simple. Everything you see there in red is a 350 pound transmission system. So if you can imagine you have 30 pounds in your car tire, this is 350 pounds and this network is fully connected with each other. So Con Edison, National Grid and the legacy Long Island local company is all interconnected together, meaning that the supply that comes into the New York facilities agree, uh, comes into the New York facilities system is diverted through transfer metering points. And I'll show you these little, uh, all these little blue shaded boxes. This connects Long Island. This blue box connects Con Edison and Brooklyn. And this blue box connects uh, the Queens and Brooklyn. And this blue box connects Long Island. 
called the transfer metering points. Basically what it means is the gas flows to either direction. So we're all in this together. If, and, and anybody, uh, you know, you guys can look out, see what's going on downtown Brooklyn here. All of the, I can tell you, I worked here when I moved into Metro. Um, one, I actually was one of the employees that moved into Metrotech on day one and, you know, uh, almost 30 years later, you could see the economic growth that's going on down here and the expansion. It's, it's exciting to see, but with that, we, we need gas. So back in 2014, we had a project called the BQI and uh, Eileen Safone, who's sitting in the back there, raise your hand, Eileen. Eileen Safone is our Director of Government Relations and she led an effort. She actually had uh, the President of the United States, uh, Barack Obama, signed an act of Congress to get this pipeline originally into Floyd Bennett Field, which is just uh, south of Flatbush Avenue. So the gate station was put in, and phase one was to get this gas into the station and come up Flatbush right by the mall and be distributed out through the transmission system. Um, the second phase was to add compression on the New Jersey side, which we did with Williams to bring in more capacity. Um, third phase was this project called Nessie, which is the Northeast Supply Enhancement. I went out to the station last week. We actually have meter runs that are, were installed to receive this gas. Um, and, and what it does is it's a line that comes all the way here and connects right into here, which is the existing line, comes up into Brooklyn and is dispersed out through these, uh, through these transfer points. It delivers 400 million decatherms a day. Just to give you an idea, that last screen I showed you with the clean renewable energy plant that we're installing, I would need to build 35 of those plants a year for 10 years to make up for what Nessie delivers in one punch. Um, and that plant, by the way, took us 10 years to, to get in service. So I just wanted to give you a con conceptual of high level view of the transmission system. <clears throat> Again, the red line that you see, that's a loop that comes from New Jersey. It, come, it goes across Raritan Bay and it ties into the existing line, and, which would feed into Floyd Bennett Field and then be dis, dis, uh, distributed through the, uh, through the system. It's a 26-inch diameter pipeline, 23.4 miles in length, and, um, and that's what it is. So from an, I wanted to talk about from an environmental standpoint how important this project is. This takes a half a million, dollar, uh, half a million cars off the road a year if approved, um, and also displaces 900,000 barrels of oil a year. From a system reliability standpoint, um, it adds another station which also uh, adds resiliency and safety to the system. And then from, from a customer, we'd, we'd be able to convert 8,000 a year. It also has effect on bills, and it could reduce bills up to, heating bills up to 65%, which is another good story. Those are the pro that's the benefit projects. Now I want to get in, and I told you I'd be brief, and I'm going to spend plenty of time to answer any of the questions you have, because I know people are frustrated. Um, on May 15th, the DEC um, denied the permit without prejudice. So Williams, I want to just be clear, we're the customer receiving this project, we're not building this project. The project is built by the Williams company, we are the receiver of that project. So um, when the project was, when they, on May 15th, what happened was, we, we're at a point right now with our system, and I can tell you from operating the system, I'm not making this up, we actually have CNG trucks that we inject into our transmission system right now. There's two trucks, and we're going to three uh, next winter. So what does that mean? These are uh, two people that 24 hours a day are sitting in an 18-wheeler, and they're valving gas into a transmission system on the top coldest 10 days of the year. When we design our system, we design it for a 10-degree average temperature. That's the coldest, so, so our engineers, when they do a, a system design, if we can't, we have those one eight point million customers that we currently serve, we have an obligation to serve those people. So as, as you see all these buildings going up and all of this growth and economic, and it's the same thing on Long Island, we don't have the adequate supply to keep it up. And what's gonna happen if we continue to take on that supply, we could be in a situation where we would have to shed firm load on the coldest day of the year, which is usually Martin Luther uh, King weekend. It's usually the coldest, that, those three or four days are usually the coldest in our system. So what, where are we today? We have, these, we have large, 84 large projects, 342. Two, uh, I mean, these are just the numbers of all the projects. But basically, in a nutshell, We've received about 3,600 applications representing over 20,000 units of natural gas, people that are on hold. And then fast forward to Friday, the Public Service Commission 
gave us an order to reconnect 1,157 of the, uh, those customers. So I want to just be clear, 3,600 plus applications, the governor and the Public Service Commission, uh, we are a regulated utility. We got an order to reconnect 1,157 of these customers. Those 1,157 customers were customers that were off the system for more than two years and then decided to come back on. So let's say you owned a deli in Brooklyn, you closed the deli, and now you're open up an Asian restaurant, but the load's the same. They will now be uh, reconnected. We don't agree with this order, but nevertheless, we are executing it because we are re regulated. And um, the good story for Brooklyn is 771 of those accounts are Brooklyn customers. So if you're in Brooklyn, I mean, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good chunk of that 1,157 are customers in the Brooklyn region that will be getting reconnected immediately. We set up an in incident command structure and our field teams are uh, contacting these customers. And if they're ready for gas, they will get gas. Keep in mind, every person that we add onto the system, we are also adding risk uh, on these coldest days. And um, I know there's been stories about the, the pipeline you've seen on TV where they say, well, it's going to take three years to build anyway. That, that's not true. If we were to get this project approved today, after four weeks, we would, get, uh, we would need a FERC approval from the government, which we think we'll get. And then Williams would start the work December, and the pipeline would be in service the following uh, December for next winter. And if we got the green light, then we would work closely with all of our constituents and customers and start to methodically connect <coughs> these people. Um, what I will tell you, and I, I will apologize to everybody in here because I am in the service business for 30 years, and if you think I don't want to serve customers, um, I do. And, and I'm getting this, every day I get a different call from, you know, whether it's, you know, a mom and pop. I got a call last week from a guy who's a police officer you know, uh, had a special needs kid, really upset, you can't get gas. And, and you try not to take it personal, but it, it does become personal because there's a story like that every day. Uh, we have big developers in Brooklyn who are frustrated. We have, uh, and I'll talk about Belmont because the New York Islanders are coming to Long Island, um, but they will not, they, right now they don't have natural gas, so they have to bring in oil or propane, that's their choice. Um, so it, it, you know, we have this three billion plus uh, projects that are uh, you know, on the east end, and then we also have you know, airport projects and other big projects that are in this area, especially over by the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So it's, it is disheartening, um, but we are working really close with our regulators to get through this, and we are still cautiously optimistic that in the end this project will get approved and we'll be able to connect every single customer on that list. So I've said a lot in 10 minutes. I appreciate your time. I do want to take questions, and I, and I will stay here after the meeting. I have my business card. I have my team, I have Terry Yard and Renee McClure from my team uh, on the customer community. Renee runs Brooklyn and Terry runs all city agencies. So um, I'm happy that they join me and, and they will assist, uh, my colleagues will assist me in any questions. So at this time, any questions, uh, please fire away and then I will also stay here after the meeting if there's anything I could do to answer a question. Questions, yes sir. So that's a great question. So we, are, we have a team that does clean energy stuff and we are providing them with information on renewables. Part of the problem that we get, and, and listen, we, people say that gas is a transitional fuel. I, I'll argue and say it's a piece of the energy puzzle. It's, it's good, you know, on the coldest day of the year, we put 2.8 billion cubic feet of gas through the system downstate. So when somebody comes and says, and I'll give you an example, I've had small businesses come to me and when it costs $40,000 to put a geothermal system in versus $1,800 to convert to gas, if you're opening up a bagel shop in Brooklyn somewhere, what, I mean, to, to answer, listen, this stuff will be scalable. Do I think 10 years from now that geothermal might cost you $1,500? Yes. And we will, we, we are providing our customers every solution that they can have. If you, It's tough. I mean, I would, you know, the options that you have is, I, I still feel like this is going to be resolved over the next month. 
and if you have that patience to wait a month, I would, I would hope that you would use gas. The other options are oil or propane. Unfortunately, that's where we're at today. Correct. So I will tell you on Long Island, I, I just read a report in Newsday, I don't know if you got, on Long Island, oil use is up by 20% since this moratorium. So from, and I care about the environment. I have three kids <laughs> that have grown up, but I, you know, if you want to make this transition and this clean transition, you have to do it in an orderly fashion. We need natural gas today to answer your question. There's so many businesses in Brooklyn that want gas today. We will continue to transition into the green renewable world, but it's going to take time. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen. Believe me, it's going to happen because our whole goals as a company has changed to get to renewables. And there might be a day with that, that red transmission system I sent you, there might be a day where we're not using that with natural gas anymore. It might be hydropower. You know, we might, if we do this right, the, this company that we, the solar and wind company, they're going to be in our upstate region, which Melanie is upstate in our Syracuse office. There's plenty of farms up there. There's going to be loads of opportunity to create clean energy. But to answer your question, sir, it's not today. It's, it's going to happen. Uh, Yes, and I will tell you, um, the, the politicians we've been dealing with have been very reasonable, and um, we've met with every elected official across the state, all the way up to the governor's chiefs of staff. We're still working very closely with our regulators. We, we haven't given up hope. But, you know, this team that you see right here, we, they're at it every single day, every night, trying to educate people. That's, well, I, I can't go with a political nar narrative, that's not my job, but all I'm going to do is I will educate you on running the system, and I will also tell you, we also have 30 power plants downstate, so uh, when I hear people say we're going to electrify all these buildings, that, that's great, but you, the more you electrify, the more natural gas you're going to use, because we don't use oil in the plants because of the environment. We only use them in emergency situations. So I just wanted to educate people and talk about facts. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank you for your time today, and I will stay around after the meeting, and I have my business card and my colleagues uh, to answer any of the questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our last presentation is with the New York City Department of City Planning, um, Jorge Fernandez. Hi everyone, good morning. good morning. I promise I won't take too long because I feel like um, I would just be preaching to the choir, uh, but I'm here today to just give you a, a subtle reminder and a push um, about the annual submission of the Statement of Community District Needs um, and budget requests. Um, this is something that should not be new to any of the district managers present, uh, but maybe to some of you representing different agencies, um, this will help you prepare or mentally prepare, if you will, um, as you uh, think about the fall budget for the fiscal year 2021. And so uh, just to level set quickly, um, I am a program manager with the Department of City Planning um, who's in charge of facilitating the annual submission of Statement of Green District Needs. Um, and we work really closely with the Office of Management and Budget in facilitating the community board budget request. So these are two charter mandated processes uh, that we've recently um, have attempted to improve both for community boards and for city agencies that these um, directly in inform uh, by streamlining the process, um, standardizing the process, and bringing it um, all online. So we've recently uh, rolled out uh, an improved website that now contains uh, the submission form. So many of the district managers have already enrolled. For those of you uh, that haven't, uh, please contact us immediately so that we can get you online and you can um, start preparing uh, your submission. And so over the past four years, um, you know, we've, we've um, moved forward with uh, standardizing the process, um, overall reform improvements uh, with the aims of not just improving the overall quality of the submissions, but also improving 
the dialogue that occurs between the community boards and agencies. Again, these are aimed at informing the city's budget, specifically agencies' budgets as it relates to programs and services. And so we're hopeful that with, these, uh, with this new process and some of the standardized um, improvements we've made, a lot of these, these conversations between the community boards and the agencies have, have improved over the years. And we've also noted and heard feedback that there are still um, various areas and opportunities for further improvement. And so that's kind of what uh, we're aiming to, to start addressing over the, um, the next few months um, as we move into the new fiscal year. And so what city planning has done uh, recently over the last uh, few months, starting in, in the spring, is uh, reaching out to different uh, city agencies, different leaders throughout uh, various mayoral offices, and reinforcing the use of the submission. So we've met with various representatives uh, across the city uh, just to remind them of what is contained in these submissions, highlighting the information that is submitted as it relates to the top issues that each district identifies, the priorities that they're submitting. Um, and we've heard throughout this outreach that they are seeing an increase in the quality. They are noticing that some community boards are um, updating them consistently, bringing in more information, more data, wherever possible. And um, as an outcome of that, agencies and different leaders uh, continue to come up with new uses for these inputs. So for example, we hear from CAU that they continue to reference these um, as they prepare for town hall meetings. Um, certain commissioners continue to reference these um, as they're engaging with community board members. And they're constantly referring to your submissions when they're thinking about, referring to the community board submissions when they're thinking about um, rolling out new programs or, um, different, or, or new services, new pilot programs within specific districts, right? Um, and so this is just a, another push to rethink and, and as we enter this new submission phase, uh, revisit some of the issues you've identified, uh, revisit some of the information that's contained in the narrative, um, and just a subtle reminder to make sure you're updating the content, right? And uh, because these agency leaders, uh, um, agency representatives, are reading through these um, throughout the, not just the budget process, but throughout the year um, as they're preparing for outreach and other um, engagements with, with the community boards and the public in general. And so if you do have dates in there, for example, and you're still referring to 2017 or 2018, just updating the year might just be a, you know, a, an easy win so that when a commissioner is reading through your narrative, um, they're not distracted by the, the possibility that this might just be this might just have been resubmitted from, from last year, right? We want to make sure that we are updating these as the conditions change, as we gather new information from, from the public and uh, with the data available that's provided by different city agencies. And so just some quick next steps, quick reminders, again, for, for many of the district managers, this should not be new. Uh, but for those of you that have already um, voted on your budget priorities. Now it's a perfect time to log on to the online form and start updating the budget requests that were submitted in there. The, the form contains all of the information from the previous year. Um, and for those of you that have not yet um, set your, your public hearing and, and to vote on the budget priorities, um, doing so in the next few weeks is going to be really important. And if you already know that you won't be able to vote on your priorities in November, please reach out to me uh, and my counterparts at OMB so that we can uh, have you know, your, your uh, estimated submission day in, in our calendars as well. Um, and of course, the submission deadline is due October 31st, which falls on a Thursday this year. And as soon as we receive your submissions, both for the needs and the budget requests, we, be, we begin the process of sharing that with all the city agencies. So the sooner we receive your submission, the sooner the agencies uh, receive the budget requests, and then that's when they can begin evaluating them and responding accordingly. Um, this deadline is not arbitrary. This aligns with um, the release of the preliminary budget. So as soon as we get these submissions, agencies typically have a month before they have to submit their responses to all budget requests submitted by all 59 community boards. And so 
there's usually a month between the submission and when the agencies have to respond. And any delay in when those budget requests are submitted um, reduces the amount of time that agencies can, can take to consider uh, your budget request, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, but just wanted to um, just give you a subtle, subtle push uh, to start revisiting uh, the online form and re revisiting um, your submissions. I will stick around for a few minutes if you do have any questions. And for those of you that have not had a chance to go on the new online website, I have a user manual that I've printed out, um, which is a helpful guide and, and gives you um, some uh, insights into some of the new features and functions. Um, so with that, if there aren't any questions, I'll stick around um, for a few minutes then. You know, one of the points that um, I wanted to certainly make um, to all of the community boards that are represented, you know, we know that we are in this moment where we have to talk to customers, right? And we need to take down to where customers are, answer questions. Um, and, and really listen to feedback. So certainly we are very open to and welcome opportunities to come down to um, your community specifically um, and have discussions with customers. Um, and we encourage that and we are asking um, for your support to make that happen because we know we have to sit um, across from customers and, and explain um, not only about what is occurring with the pipeline project, um, but with the moratorium and certainly in, um, with the now restoration of, uh, you know, hopefully phase one of uh, the activation of customers. Because there are still many customers that will not be reconnected until um, you, you know the project is approved. Um, so certainly, please, please, we're encouraging and asking for your support um, to drive down to those community meetings. Thank you. So we don't have any new bu old business, but new business. If the other agencies that are here, if you can sort of report out on things that you have going on. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Parker with the Department of Small Business Services. On Wednesday, November 13th, SBS will be hosting a small business resource fair. Those of you not familiar, we host these events in all five boroughs as an opportunity for small businesses and entrepreneurs to get key information on licensing and permits, thereby avoiding any unnecessary summonses and violations. We have about nine regulatory agencies that come We have about nine different regulatory agencies that table at these events, providing key information on starting a business and operating a business within compliance of city rules and regulations. Uh, this event is taking place from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., during which time we'll be hosting also a digital marketing course uh, free to all attendees, compliments of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. This event is being sponsored by Borough President Eric Adams, as well as Councilman Levin and the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. I'm passing around some flyers for you to distribute to the businesses in your districts. We have, uh, if you have any language needs, we can translate these uh, flyers in about eight different languages. Uh, please uh, distribute these flyers and uh, encourage uh, those interested to register on Eventbrite. And, uh, just like your assistance in helping us educate the businesses that you serve in your district. Thank you. I'm actually curious what small business services is telling potential business owners about not being able to get gas. I'm sorry, sir. I'm so Well, unfortunately, we don't have jurisdiction over that service, but we do at times have a business. Are you telling them that maybe now is not the time to open your business? Uh, 
we would never encourage businesses not to choose a time to do that. But what we could do, mm -hmm. we do have what's called business advocates that help businesses um, navigate through government and regulatory um, agencies as well as entities. So at times, uh, when there's an issue with uh, utility service, our project advocates can reach out to the utilities to see what they can find out about finding out any information on the process and how long it might take for them to get that service. But that's about the extent to which we can kind of uh, manage that. Hopefully, we can forge a better relationship with the utilities and make that information more transparent to the small businesses. But that would take some time. Yeah. And then certainly, you, I, I encourage you, reach out, give us a call, because there are customers that are still being connected today, right? It's like for like, right? It's, it, there are instances where there are customers still being connected, um, but... Is there a guarantee of that? I'm investing all this money into a business, and at the end, I can't... And, and what we... And what we encourage customers to do, especially right now, because again, we are all in uncharted waters, all right? So what I'm encouraging um, businesses and future businesses to do, give us a call. Talk about the location that you're looking at. Tell us about the business and the type of business that you want at a specific location. And then we can talk to you today to say, based on um, the, the load requirements that you are looking at for your type of business, this would be an increase load or has this meter been inactive for a long time? There are things we can do at least right now to help at least businesses make a decision on how they want to move forward. Um, and then we have to be there to have that discussion right now for customers. So tell them to pick up the phone, give us a call. My entire team is here. So and, I have and information, we just exchange information. Absolutely. Just, yeah. um, you know, and, and, and again, we're in uncharted waters, so we'll have to take it customer by customer. Absolutely. And I would just add from a government relations perspective, we have Lyle Scalera on our team, economic development. He's been in touch with Greg Bishop, your commissioner. Okay. And we've run some calls with the different agencies to kind of let them know the status, where things are at. So we are having an ongoing dialogue with the different agencies. And Terry actually is very involved with the agencies, and her and I are working very closely on that. So we'll stay in touch. OK, very good. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> okay, so I'll just officially announce the annual plan summary is on the Department for the Aging's website. I've been out at several community board district service cabinet meetings, and I've been announcing that we've not yet posted our listing of uh, public hearings. It's official. It looks like it was put up Friday night. I've not had an opportunity to read it, but it, w it does outline the goals, the plans, the objectives of the Department for the Aging over the next year or so, the types of services that we're uh, going to be providing to the population that is 60 and over in this city. The Brooklyn hearing, that's most important for everybody around the table, is Monday, October 28th, and it will take place um, at 10 a.m. at the Park Slope Center for Successful Aging, 463A 7th Street. But you can read the summary. I'm thankful to Jeremy and to Sean. I must call them out because they have come to the hearings in the past, so I encourage our community board district managers to do the same, um, to encourage your community, the stakeholders, to come out and to testify, let the department know what within the summary, I guess, sounds good about the goals and objectives, what we're doing within the communities that's working and not working, or not working, but give feedback, it's so important. Go ahead, Sean. 10 a.m. It's all, it's uh, 10 a.m. until noon. And just uh, just said, this is the, um, this is one of the things that makes the visit the October 31st deadline a little bit tough because agencies are just now coming out and yeah. so sorry it's so late. Can now get the the I mean, hopefully I'll be ready to just you know, be done and only add it, but some of the coordination of others in the agencies and their timelines was uh, just
see if it rings, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Good morning still. Um, Sandra Sanchez, FDNY Community Affairs. Just want to announce thank you to our community board members that helped promote and distribute our National Fire Safety Week with our open house that took place October 5th and 6th. But on to change your clock, change your batteries as we are nearing the end of daylight savings time. We are asking that another message that you share with your constituency is that as we are changing our clocks, we remember to check and make sure that our fire alarms and carbon monoxide alarms are in full working order. Should you like to partner with the fire department to help promote this initiative throughout your district, I leave you with my number, 